Um, so today we uh, continue with the book of the Acts of the Apostles, and this will be the 70th part, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, part 70. Last week we saw uh, what is required if we are to be friends of Jesus. We said, uh, one, that we must agree with him. That is, we must agree with him in terms of his nature, his character. So we must be righteous, we must be holy, we must take up his will as ours while relinquishing ours. We said that uh, we must walk with him by faith, trusting him no matter what happens. Thirdly, we said that we cannot be friends with Jesus and the world at the same time. We must first be divorced from the world and have uh, no desire for it afterwards. Fourthly, we said that we must be rid of every vestige of pride, arrogance, and boastfulness. Humility is a chief attribute of a friend of Jesus. Fifthly, we said that we must consider his word as sacrosanct and not trifle with it. Once he speaks, we must reverentially uh, carry out his instructions. Uh, six, we said that being friends with Jesus will cost us everything. So we need to count the cost and we must be prepared to pay the price, even if it is death. And lastly, we said that friendship with Jesus is, for, is a forever affair. And you don't have to be a hermit or a recluse while being a friend of Jesus. We saw that especially uh, looking at the life of um, uh, Enoch. Enoch continued to have children, continued to be a father, continued to be in the, in, the, in, the, in the community and so on and so forth. So when he was not found, he was missed. So it wasn't as if he was just somebody who wasn't there at all. So we, we, don't have to be, we don't have to be reclusive. We don't have to be hermits because we are friends with Jesus. No. Friends with Jesus and not being friends with the world simply means that we have put the world aside. We concluded by noting that the Lord is not about religion, but a relationship. And those who honor him, he in, turns, he in turn rather will honor them and he will dwell with them no matter where they live. We saw that um, in, in the case of um, the, 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 the temple in Jerusalem, when he went there and he was not wanted, he left and went to the house of the poor. If you fulfill the condition of friendship, the Lord will come and be with you. It doesn't matter whether you live in a slum or you live in a palace. It's, it's irrelevant to him. Where you live on earth is irrelevant to the Lord. We saw how he was with Joseph in Potiphar's home as his, while Joseph was a slave. He was with Joseph while he was in prison as a prisoner. And he was with Joseph in the palace when he became prime minister. So it, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter to, to God at all. What matters to God is that you are uh, you, you, you have met the conditions for friendship. Um, and of course, um, we, we, also, we also concluded that we must not be under the wrong notion that because we are now friends with Jesus, temptation will not come. No, 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 no. In fact, being friends with Jesus is what is going to attract temptation the more because Satan wants to come and stop you from that relationship. He wants to sever that relationship. And the basis on which he does that is to uh, come up with tricks, with ploys, with wiles, so that he can, you know, trick us away from that relationship. But in the name of Jesus, he will fail and he has already failed. Praise be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So let's take our text for today. Acts chapter 4, and I'm going to be reading from verse 7 through to verse 16. Acts chapter 4, from verse 7 to verse 16. And when they had set them in the midst, that is Peter and John, and that is the Sanhedrin setting them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised 
from the dead. By him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus and seen the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded but when they had commanded them to go as to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. I'm going to read verse 14 to 16 because that's where we're going to dwell uh, in our study today. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they commanded, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Praise the name of the Lord. The realization by the Sanhedrin that Peter and John were close associates or friends of Jesus amazed them. But it did not stop them. It did not stop their opposition. However, the Bible tells us that when they saw the man who had been made to walk standing there beside Peter and John, it stopped them in their tracks. It was undeniable. It was irrefutable proof of the power of God, that something had happened. And they themselves observed that it was a notable miracle indeed. Because, and why, why was it a notable miracle? It was notable because the lame man was known to them. It was known to all. You see, some of the miracles that people are taunting today cannot be said to be notable miracles because we don't even know these people. Nobody seems to know them. They just seem to appear and say how they were healed and that is all. We, we know the story so well of a particular woman who was always, uh, their, her hand was always being healed by up to five or six uh, 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 people and is always pasted on social media. You can, you can see how uh, unintelligent people can be until people began to realize that, wait a minute, this is the same woman and th th this is the same miracle everywhere. And so you find them to be liars. You find them to be false. But in this particular case, it was a notable miracle because everybody had known this man they had known him in Jerusalem. They had seen him and they knew who he was. And they had known that he was a lame man sitting at the temple. Suddenly they saw him standing on his own feet beside Peter and John. By the grace of God, our prayer is that our witness will produce such undeniable, irrefutable proof and notable miracles. For example, we saw that, we know that in John chapter 9, such a miracle took place. When you remember the story of the blind man, the man who was born blind, 40-year-old man who was born blind, they said that that's the age of also this man. He was born blind, and the Lord Jesus Christ, his disciples were asking him who had sinned. Was it this man, or was it the man's parents? And the Lord said um, to the disciples that it's not the man, neither is it the parents, but that, that the works of God might be uh, performed. That's why this man has come. That's why, that's why he's here, and that's why this situation is here today. So he went, put mud on the man's eyes, and told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. The man went and came back saying. And then when he arrived at the, the temple area, people began to wonder, Ah, is this not that blind man? He said, no, it can't be. They said, the man said, I am the one. And then a whole load of antiques began. They began to question, are you sure you are the one? What happened? Were you really, were you really blind? They came and called his, um, they called his uh, mother. They, they, they called his mother and asked uh, the parents and asked them, is this your son? He, he, how, how was he healed? Is, is, he, is he truly, was he truly blind? And they said, well, how he was healed, we don't know. But one thing we know is that this, our son, we gave, we gave back to him blind. How he came to see, we don't know. And then eventually, when he came to the man, the man said, look, you can argue all you care because they said, the Lord, that man is a sinner. Whoever healed you is a sinner. He looked at him doing his healing on the Sabbath. What, 
The guy said to them, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference to me. But one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. That is a notable miracle. That is the kind of miracle that by the grace of God, we would like to see. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13 and 15, Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. A notable miracle is what happens when you see somebody who was a, a, a petulant fellow, somebody who was a known sinner, a stark unbeliever, somebody who was a madman, a raving madman, a thief, a criminal, a liar, somebody who was insulting. When you see that person, and because the Lord Jesus Christ has touched him, his life has changed. People say, we don't recognize this guy again. That is a notable miracle. Because everybody knew that guy to be something that was, is horrible. And then the Lord Jesus Christ comes into that man's life and changes him. That is the kind of miracle we are talking about. We're not just talking about healing people and other things. No, we're talking of a changed life. It is that transformed life that we're talking about when we witness that lives will be transformed. In Mark chapter 16, Mark 16 verse 20, Mark 16 verse 20, the Bible tells us uh, about the, 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 the latter part of after the Lord Jesus Christ had given his last command to his disciples and they had all gone. In verse 20 it says, And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. My prayer is that as we go out and as we witness, Almighty God himself will rot the accompanying signs and men will will be awed at what changes have taken place in the lives of the people who have heard the gospel. Praise the name of the Lord. But there is something in the verses that we've read, especially verse 14 and verse 16, or rather verse 14, that, you know, if we are not careful, we will gloss over it. By the grace of God, we are not going to gloss over it, over, over that, and this will be, the, 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 the subject of our discussion today. Let me draw our mind back that this man was healed. He now could walk on his own. He, he could have gone anywhere. You remember before, it was where they set him, that was where he sat. But now, his feet were whole. He could walk, he could have gone anywhere he wanted to do, go. But instead, on that particular day, he went to the trial of Peter and John and stood beside them. He didn't say anything. So we, we, we can say that the man started out sitting at the gate, like many of us, we sit outside. We're not in the temple. We're not in the house of God. God is not in our lives. We started, every, every man on earth starts sitting at the gate. We all start outside the kingdom of God. But then a miracle takes place and we're able to stand on our own feet. We're able to, like, like, like this man, he walked, he leapt, he went into the temple. And so the next thing we find the man doing, after, after, after he was healed and was able to stand on his feet, was that he was singing in the temple and giving thanks to God. And for many people, this is where it all ends. But not this man. And that is the lesson that God wants to teach us today. For this man, he went before the dreaded Sanhedrin. Nobody was excited about going to stand before the Sanhedrin. And I don't think that this man was arrested along with Peter and John. Why would they arrest him? In fact, looking at what had happened, I don't think they would have wanted the man to be there. But the man was there. He went, stood with Peter and John. And you would note, he said nothing. He just stood there. But just standing there and saying nothing silenced the Sanhedrin. What this man did would form our subject matter for today. What this man did was serving the Lord. So our subject matter for today is serving the Lord. We must go from sitting at the gate and move beyond singing in the temple to serving the Lord. Many of us have been born again 
we go to church, we sing, we do all those things, but we are not really serving the Lord. We can't say we are serving. So we want to look at this subject. What does it mean to serve the Lord? Serving the Lord is a present continuous tense. It's not, it's not something that stops. It's continuous. What that means is that when you begin to serve, you never retire. You can take a break, but you must refire. So you never really retire. You never really go off until you leave the earth. Serving the Lord means serving the purpose of God. Not your purpose, but the purpose of God. Not what you have purposed. So let's go into the scriptures. Luke chapter 1. And I read from verse 70 to verse 75. Luke chapter 1 from verse 70 to verse 75. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. The essence of our salvation, the essence of the miracles that God wrought in delivering us from the hand of Satan is so that we might serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Not some days of our lives, but all the days of of our lives. And we saw this man's service in Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 4, verse 14, that all he did was to get dressed, go to the, the, the temple, or go to the court as it were, and just stand there. He said nothing. He did nothing more than that. He just stood there. And that was his service. Sometimes we think that serving the Lord is about moving all over the place. We think that we are serving the Lord because we are doing something, because we are actively engaged in something. In Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, reading from verse, um, Luke 10, from verse 38, from verse 38 to 42, that's the end. Now it happened as they went that he, that is Jesus, entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Now see how the Lord Jesus described what Martha was doing. He said, you are worried or you are anxious about so many things. You are troubled. About many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. One thing was needed on this occasion, and that's why we said that serving the Lord is serving His purpose. And what was needed was for them to have sat down uh, with, um, what was for them to have sat down with um, uh, Jesus and listen to His word. That was what was needed. But they didn't do that. Martha didn't do that. Mary did that. And the Lord said, I'm not going to take that away from, I'm not going to take that away from Mary. You see, sometimes before you can serve, you need to know what you need, what, what area of service God has for you. And many of many a times we miss out on that when we are serving the Lord. We miss out on what areas or, 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 or what it is that the Lord wants us to do. And we go ahead and start doing other things. And in the process, we, we, we lose out completely on what it is that God wants us to do. M Martha was busy. But it didn't mean that she was doing what she ought to have been doing. It is possible that merely sitting down, hearing the Lord speak, eventually they will say, okay, now we are, we are through with what we want to discuss. Whatever you have for us, we will take at this point in time. But no, she didn't do that. She went ahead and just did what she wanted. And then now wanted the Lord to stop Mary from doing what was needful, which Mary was doing. And the Lord said, no, 
I'm not going to stop her from doing that. You two, come and sit down and hear. I, I find that a lot in many churches. There are people who do ushering, who are moving all over the place. They're everywhere trying to get people to sit down, which is a good thing on its own. But then they end up not hearing a single bit of the word. They run around the whole place. And at the end of the day, they don't even buy the messages in many churches. Some churches, they don't even have recorded messages. So they don't even have access to the message. They have no access to the word. And they are busy. And that might not, they might think they are serving the Lord, but that is not serving the Lord. Serving the Lord is when you are serving his purpose, not your purpose, not what you think is the right thing to do. In Luke chapter 13, verse 6 and 7, Luke 13, 6 and 7, is the story of the, the, the vine owner who planted a fig tree in his vineyard and then came looking for, for figs, but find, found none. All he had were, were leaves. And he said, no, I came here looking for fruit, not for leaves. So we need to understand that what is important to the Lord Jesus Christ is fruit, not leaves. A lot of people are running all over the place, you know, going to pick leaves, doing activities, engaging activities, whereas what God is interested in is, is our serving him. Whatever he wants us to do, he wants us to serve. What all he required of that uh, lame man that day who had been healed was just to go there and stand. And nothing more. Just go there and stand. That's all he required. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 16 and 17. 16 and 17. Um, Paul was writing here to him. He says, at my first defense, no one stood with me. No one. But all forsook me. Everybody had left me. Sometimes, all that is required in serving the Lord is to stand by someone. Just to be there. Maybe to comfort the person, to encourage the person, to, 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 to lead the person. We, we don't, but you know, we just need to find out what it is that God wants us to do. Sometimes we, you know, when we talk of serving the Lord, we, we, the, what comes to our mind is something big. Sometimes we think it is, oh, we have to get a large chunk of money so that we can move this work forward. Sometimes all God wants you to do is just be there. Just be there. Do whatever it is that is asking you to do. All that Paul needed at this point in time was for somebody to stand by him. And there was no one. He said, all forsook me. In verse 10 of the same second uh, Timothy chapter 4, he said, he said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed to Thessalonica. Demas loved this world and abandoned Paul. Many, many people who say that they are serving the Lord, who claim or believe that they are serving the Lord, they are like Demas. They have actually gone in pursuit of the world. And have left the vineyard of God untended. They have gone on their own pursuits. If you had asked uh, 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 Demas that day, he would say, "Ah, there are souls. There are there are, there are souls in uh, in Thessalonica." But we know that he didn't go to Thessalonica because of souls. He went there because of what he wanted. He went there because, like like Paul wrote, he said, "Having loved this present world." He had fallen in love with the present world. Thank God last week we looked at uh, being a friend of Jesus. And we said you cannot be friends with Jesus and, be, and befriend the world at the same time. It's not possible. You must make up your mind. You must divorce the world. And then you can truly be a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 17 of the same Second uh, 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 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes, says, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Yes, the Lord is with us. But sometimes he just needs you as a person to stand by somebody. It's not as if God is not with people, but sometimes all God needs is your physical presence there to encourage the person to keep doing the work of God. Sometimes just to go and sit down with somebody. And discuss scripture with the person. Encourage the person in the Lord. That's all that might be required of you. 
It's not for you to just say, it's like what, what the Bible says, that how, how can you say you have faith if, if, if you say to somebody, uh, the man comes to you and says he, he, needs, he needs help. And then you go, okay, uh, receive help in Jesus' name. And then you say go. Meanwhile, you have the means to give to him. How have you helped him? How is that love? So we must understand that serving the Lord is, is not just um, running around or carrying things. Sometimes it's just standing by somebody. It might just be standing by the, that pastor. There are pastors who are so lonely. They are alone. A phone call will help. Standing by that pastor sometimes is just there just to go and visit him and say hello. That's all that is needed. Then again, in John chapter 21, John chapter 21, when the Lord was departing, he, he said to Peter, uh, let me just read that. Uh, let me read from verse, verse 18 and 19. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you gathered yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. Serving the Lord is the same thing as glorifying God. And in this particular case, Peter was, was being told that he would go to a place where he would be killed. And by so doing, he would be glorifying. That is, he will be serving the purpose of God. He will be serving the purpose of God. Sometimes, those beatings, those persecutions, those things, they serve the purpose of God. Today, we have examples in scripture of people who were beaten of people who were killed, of people who were stoned, of people who were discarded, who were persecuted for the sake of the gospel. They served the purpose of God for us. The Bible tells us that those things that were written of old, they are written for our own admonition, for those of us who are there today. So when we read about people who are serving the Lord, it's not just about people who are running helter-skelter, moving all over the place. No. That could be part of it. However, more importantly, is that you are talking about people who are doing the purpose or serving the purpose of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, it says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Faithfulness is required in serving the Lord. And what is faithfulness? The Bible tells us that in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 24, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, gave us an example of faithfulness. Matthew 24, verse 45 to 51. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his house, over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. Let's stop there. A faithful servant. When we say serving God, serving the Lord faithfully, we are saying that you are doing what the Lord wants you to do when you are supposed to do it. Not when you want to do it, but when you are supposed to do it. Doing what God has asked you to do at the time he has asked you to do it. That is serving the Lord. We cannot say we are serving the Lord in our own time, in our own way, in our own manner. No, there is a manner by which we will serve the Lord. And he wants us to serve in that manner. So when we are serving the Lord, we should be serving faithfully. Doing what he wants us to do at the time he wants us to do it. Serve faithfully. In John chapter 15, verse 16. John 15, verse 16. The Lord uh, said there, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. We are to serve bearing fruit. That is our serving the Lord must be fruitful. Martha's service was not fruitful because she wasn't doing the needful. She was doing what she thought was the needful, but not what was the needful. 
So we don't serve doing what we think we should do. We serve doing what the Lord wants us to do. We serve wholeheartedly doing what God says we should do. He said that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. God wants us to be fruitful in our service of him. That brings me to Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. How, how are we to serve? How do we serve the Lord? Verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you by the mercies of God, because of all the sacrifice that Jesus did in bringing you out of sin and sanctifying you, saving you from sin, that you present your bodies, offer yourself to present this, give yourself as an offering to God, including your body. And when we talk of your body, your eyes, your brain, your ears, your hands, your feet, your reproductive organs, your mouth, every part of your body, your internal organs, everything, submit to God. Offer it to God. In, 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 in Leviticus, we read about the whole bond offering that is all given, to, wholly presented to God and is burnt up, not to be used by anybody. That offering signaled the dedication and devotion of the offerer to God. So the Bible is telling us here that we should offer ourselves as devoted people, as dedicated people. Let me let me just pause here. I'm coming back to Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 1. But let's look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And um, we'll read verse 1 to 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 5. Moreover, brethren... We make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberty, of their liberality. These were, these were poor people. These were people facing life challenges. They were facing afflictions. Yet they abounded in joy in those afflictions. He says, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Nobody compelled them. Nobody forced them. You should not be forced to serve God. You should not be compelled to serve God. Imploring us with much urgency or entreaty that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So the important thing is that you must give yourself to offer yourself to the Lord. Present yourself to God. When you have presented yourself to God, every part of you now goes. Your money, your time, your energy, everything goes into it. That is how we serve God. We serve God by offering ourselves first. And then any other thing that God wants, it goes. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, the Bible says, And he died, that Jesus died for all. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. This is what is being said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Offer yourselves to God. Present yourself to God. Give yourself unto God as a, 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 a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. One that is alive, not one that is dead. One that is active. Some people will go and walk and labor and do everything. Then when it is, when they are around age 70 and they are retired from their secular work, then they say they want to serve God. No, serve God when you have the energy, while you are in your youth, while you are strong. A time will come when you will not be able to serve God actively. Yes, in your old age, you can still serve God, but you will not be as actively as when you are young. Don't spend your youth your youthful years, your youthful time, 
doing strange things. Use it to serve God and use it to serve him appropriately. A living sacrifice, a whole burnt offering that is dedicated and devoted to the Lord. Give yourself to him. Surrender yourself to him. Present yourself. Take yourself to the Lord and say, Father, use me as you want to use me. And it, it talks about a living sacrifice. Holy. You have to be holy. Without spot, without blemish. Let's not be like the children of Israel. Let's read that in Malachi. Who, who went and started bringing strange, presenting strange gifts to God. Malachi chapter 1. I read from verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests. Who despise my name. Yet you say. In what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food. On my altar. But say. In what way have we defiled you? By saying. The table of the Lord is contemptible. That there, there is no need to take anything good. There. Just take anything. God will take anything. You know we have that teaching. God will. If you can use anything Lord you can use me. No. God does not use anything. He will use you. But first he will clean you up. And he expects you to remain clean. In verse 8 it says, And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. But now entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us, while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. You now go and say, hey, please, entreat God on our behalf. Let him accept us. When you have gone to pre pre present blind, lame, uh, 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 halt offerings to God. Offerings that are a, a, a contempt to the table of the Lord. Who is there, even among you, who would shut the doors? Who, who among the priests will even shut the doors? So that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? Because it's vanity. Trying to serve God in sin is vain. It's not going to be acceptable. Trying to serve God with, with spots and blemishes is, is, is vain. Uh, it says, so let me read again, uh, verse 10 again. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the, sun, of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. You know, we, we, we have belittled the name of God amongst the Gentiles, amongst the unbelievers. Because we are doing the most contemptible things. We say God will accept anybody. And then people go to church anyhow. There is no righteousness in the, way they, in the way they dress. No righteousness in the way they speak. Nothing that is righteous in the way we conduct ourselves, even when we go to church. And so people around look at it and say, what is in that church, Seth? We hear stories of the kind of crazy things that pastors are doing these days. In verse 12 it says, but you profane it. You profane the name of the Lord. In that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit its food is contemptible. It doesn't matter. We can take anything there. We, we, make, we make drug addicts, pastors. I don't know what the hunger is to, for ordination that we ordain all kinds of people to be pastors. In verse 10 it says, you also say, oh, what a weariness. And you snare at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? You go and steal from the government till you steal from your from your from your uh, employers you 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 do deals and then you bring the the result of that deal and you say you are presenting it to god as an officer am i going to accept such a thing that's a stolen good you go and prostitute yourself and you bring money and say you are praying offering is that is god supposed to accept that at your hands in verse 14 he says but cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifice to the Lord what is what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, 
and my name is to be feared among the nations. Brethren, God is interested in our being holy. It's not just something that is doing for fun. Paul wrote, uh, Peter wrote, I think in first, in first Peter chapter 1, is it verse 15 to 17 there about? He says, be holy for I am, God says, be holy because I, I am holy. So we must be holy. We do not present uh, blemished things to God. We present holy things unto God. The Bible says that the Lord is coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. That's Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27. And God is interested in that kind of a church serving him. He's not interested in uh, strange people serving him. He wants people who, who, would, who would give everything to him. Give their lives. Be devoted to him. Be holy. And then he says, acceptable. Acceptable to God. That is, people who are well-pleasing unto God. The Bible says that without faith, we cannot please God. So we're not just talking of being holy, but walking in a manner that is acceptable by faith, trusting God. And then the Bible now says, this is your reasonable, rational, or logical service. Why is it rational? Because for all that God has done for you, the least you can do is to serve him. That's the least you can do. So it says it's your rational, your logical, your reasonable service unto God, or your reasonable act of worship before God. Our service to God is also an act of worship. In Joshua chapter 24, we won't have time to read that, from 14 to 25, uh, from 14 to 24, Joshua 24, 14 to 24, you can, you can read that on your own. When Joshua challenged the people that they should serve the Lord, that they should serve him in sincerity and in truth, and then uh, he goes on to say that, well, if you say you will not serve God, choose who you want to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people said, we will serve God. And they began to speak about what God had done for them and everything. And Joshua said to them eventually, he said, you cannot serve God because he's a holy God. Because he's a jealous God. What was Joshua saying there? Joshua said, you need to know who you want to serve. Don't serve him because of all, just because he had done this, he had done this. No, serve him because of who he is. He says, oh, he's a jealous God. After he has, after he has helped you if, you, should, if you should forsake him, he will turn around and do you evil. So you need to know who you are serving. In John chapter 4, John chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ said that we are to serve God in spirit and in truth. That is, we are to serve God under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We are to serve God by the Holy Spirit and with a pure heart, with a clean heart. With a hand that is yielded to God. A hand that is acceptable to God. In spirit and in truth. God is looking for such people to worship him. To serve him. The word service and worship are actually used interchangeably. Because in serving God, what you are doing is actually worshiping God. Worship is not just limited to the time when you stay in one corner and you are singing, you are lifting your hands, you are bowing down to God, you are lying prostrate. No, even the, the things that we do, our going out, our going to where we are going is worship. What is the What does the word worship really mean? The word worship means to value someone, the worth, the worthiness of that person. If you valued God, if God is worthy of our worship, then we would obey him. But when God says we should do something and we don't do it, what we have done is to devalue him. That is, we are not worshipping him, it means we are not serving him. So when Martha was running all over the place, she was not serving the Lord, she was serving herself. She wanted to make the Lord Jesus Christ happy by what she would bring. But it was what the Lord wanted that would make him happy. Not what she was bringing, but that's what she thought. She thought by doing this, she would be And when she saw that Martha, Mary was not joining her in doing it. She, she, she went to the Lord to say, force her to come. Say, no, I can't. Mary has chosen that good part. You need to come and sit down and hear the word. You are, you are troubled about many. You are anxious. You need to hear the word of God that will calm you down. Many of us are running to many places, listening to many messages. These messages make us run all over the place. They challenge us to go and be rich. They challenge us to go and do something. Challenge us to go and do this. But what is the Lord saying to you? That is the question. 
And we never focus on what the Lord is saying. We focus more on what other people are saying. And we like those messages. Because they make us active. They make us run all over the place. And yet sometimes all God is saying is be still and know that I am God. How do we serve the Lord? Let me go back to Romans 12 again and continue to read. This time around, I will read from verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. I've caught a lot of uh, some verses there, but you can read later. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. God gives us gifts when we come to him. He says, use those gifts, put them to use. Paul challenged Timothy. He said, stir up the gift that's in you by the laying on of... When I laid hands on you, gifts came up to you. Stir it up. Use them. It's time for us to use the gifts of God. The gifts of God are just sitting down dormant in many of us. Dormant, doing nothing. We have abandoned it and we are running all over the place. Serving our own purpose. Meanwhile, he has given us all that we need to serve him. But we have packed it aside. He says, use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion of our faith. Don't prophesy more than is necessary. Don't prophesy the way one big prophet is prophesying. Prophesy according to how much God has, has helped you. And leave it there. Uh, or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Don't give more than you can give. Give what you have, what God has given you to give. Give. But don't give grumbling. Give with joy. Give with excitement. Show mercy with cheerfulness. In verse 9 it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Let our love be love indeed. Not hypocritical love. Where we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are saying I love you, but in, at the back of our hands, at the back, uh, behind us, we are, our hand is behind us, and we are holding a dagger, waiting for an opportune time to plunge it into the heart of that man that we just told that we love. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. This is, this is the holy living, the acceptable way by which we serve God. In verse 10, it says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Humility, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. With fervency, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not let, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It tells us how to serve God. Serve him. Don't, don't do what is evil and say, well, he did this to me. No. Be kind to all men. Do what is good. Serve the Lord. Be fervent. Be urgent. Stop procrastinating. Follow peace with all men. Don't be the one that is the cause of, of trouble in, in your neighborhood or in the church. There are people, once they enter into a church, the whole church scatters. They, they, cannot, be, they cannot live at peace with anybody. That's not who we are supposed to be. In Acts chapter 20, Paul spoke to the church in Ephesus on his way out about serving the Lord. And let me read from verse 18. And when they had come, that's Acts 20 verse 18 to 24. And when they had come to him, that is to Paul, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, 
in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, terrifying, uh, testifying rather to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations are with me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He said, I served with humility, but now I am going, as it were, bound in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one leading me, directing me, saying to me, go to Jerusalem. I have work for you in Jerusalem. He said, and he has told me that bonds, persecution, trials, tribulations await me there. He said, but I don't count my life as, as anything. Count my life cheap. Don't count it as anything that I must withhold. I'm ready to go to serve the Lord, even in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 23, verse 11, after Paul had been arrested in Jerusalem and he went to speak to the people and there was an uproar and he was brought in back into the prison house by the uh, centurion there. In, 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 the, the Bible says, verse 11, but the following night, the Lord stood by him, stood by Paul, and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So he said, not only in Jerusalem, you are going to Rome also. You are going to give testimony in Rome. You are not just going to Rome to see the, the beauty of the city. No, you are going there to be a testimony, to be a testimony to me in Rome. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, the Bible tells us, But as you are bound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you are bound in this grace also. Here he's talking about giving. Abound in all the graces, especially the grace of serving the Lord. It's a grace that God gives to us. As he gave to this lame man who had been healed, the grace of serving. Let us serve the Lord. Let us serve him in spirit and in truth. Through his service, like as I continue to repeat, this man said nothing. He silenced them. They couldn't say anything. Because he was there as a, a proof of the good deed that Peter and John had done. When that man woke up that morning with his two legs, he walked to that courthouse. To stand by Peter and John. That was him serving the Lord. Even as he stood there. Even as he said nothing. Just standing there. He was serving the Lord. By standing there. He shamed and silenced the Sanhedrin. That man's service was effective. It was fruitful. It was productive. It was faithful. Whenever God asks you. To go or stay somewhere. Your obedience is a service to the Lord. When we don't obey God, it's a great disservice. And whatever the Lord asks you to do, that you do, that is your act of worship unto him. If you truly value God, you will do what he's asking you to do. But you see, some of us are in the habit of murmuring and complaining. And so it doesn't matter because this thing is a nature. We will still murmur and complain even when God is asking us. That's why the Lord wants us to stop that thing. Stop it. Don't stop justifying murmuring. Stop justifying complaining. Stop justifying procrastination. Stop justifying anything. That will make you not to serve God. Any attitude that is contrary to the fruit of the Spirit. Stop justifying it. Because 
what you are doing in a very invariably is saying that it doesn't matter who I will do it because one day you will not realize it is God. Sometimes you know we think that it, it is is because well is is because it's God I will do it. One day you will not know that it's God who wants you to do something, and you will act in that particular way. So, brethren, let us serve faithfully in spirit and in truth. Let us serve fruitfully, productively, and effectively. Let us serve giving ourselves wholly unto the Lord. Giving ourselves wholly unto the Lord. Without spot or blemish. As a whole burnt offering. Wholly presented on the altar. Let us serve with humility. Honoring and preferring others. Let us serve with fervency and urgency. Not being slothful. Not procrastinating. Let us serve. Not repaying evil for evil. But pursuing peace with all men. And living vengeance to God. Let us serve. Bearing each other's burdens and grief. Let us serve. Enduring temptation. But rejoicing in persecution. For so they persecuted the prophets of old. These were the threats that we saw amongst the early apostles. Look at Paul. What he said in, 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 in Acts chapter 20 that we just read. He said, look, the Spirit of God has told me that I'm going in bonds and everywhere I go, I'm, I'm hearing that bonds are with me. He said, I'm ready to go even to die. If you are not ready to die, you cannot serve the Lord. Our ultimate service to the Lord is to be ready to die. Even if we don't die serving the Lord, that is, we are not killed for the sake of serving Him, that must be at the back of our minds that we are ready to die serving the Lord. Finally, let us quit whining and wanting to know the end from the beginning before we obey God. You know, that's how some of us want. We want to, Lord, what is it that you're asking me to do? Why are you asking me to do this thing? We want to know the, the, the end from the very beginning. That is a disservice to the Lord. It is an act contrary to faith. It is indeed faithlessness. David had no inkling that morning when his father told him, go to the uh, field, go, go to the battlefield and find out the state of your brothers. He never knew that as he was obeying his father in going to that field, that his life was going to be changed. That the spirit of God that was upon him was going to push him to go and fight against Goliath and destroy Goliath. That for 40 days, he didn't know that for 40 days, Goliath had withstood the armies of God. And that there was nobody but him. He didn't know. But he obeyed. What of Joseph? That morning, when Joseph's father said to Joseph, go to the field, go and find out the state, the welfare of your brothers, and come back and give me a report. Joseph didn't know what was awaiting him. He just knew that my father said I should do this and he went and obeyed. It was while he went to see his brothers that they bound him and sold him off to the Ishmaelites who sold him off to Potiphar. While in Potiphar's home, he served the Lord because the Bible says that God was with him. He served the Lord. Even though he was serving Potiphar, but it was the Lord he served in Potiphar's home. And then temptation came. He overcame temptation. Yet he was imprisoned. While in the prison, he served the Lord. And then he came to the palace. While in the palace, he served the Lord. The point we're trying to make here is that we should stop whining. We should stop murmuring. We should stop complaining. God can make you serve him anywhere. It could be as a servant. That is why you need to be humble. You need humility. This braggadocious that we carry around and thinking I'm this, I'm this. We are not important. That is the simple truth. God is the one that is important. We must present ourselves to God. 
and haven't presented yourself to God, he will do with you as he likes. If you present yourself as a, as a sacrifice to Almighty God and then you want to withdraw, how did you present yourself? You have not presented yourself yet. We must be ready to serve the Lord in whatever capacity, anywhere he chooses for us. Let us go to God now in prayer and talk to the Lord and ask him to help us. Ask him to help us to serve him to serve his purpose. To continue to serve him. Until it is time. For us to go to be with him. Let's pray. And ask the Lord. To put in us. All the graces. That's required. For us to serve him acceptably. All the graces required for us to serve the Lord acceptably. Let's ask that the Lord will put in us. Faithfulness. Fruitfulness. Humility. Holiness, fervency, urgency, the pursuit of peace with all men, the, 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 the grace to overcome temptation, the, the, the joy to, 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 to rejoice, to be glad in persecution. Let's talk to the Lord. The willingness to stand and not move when that is all he requires. The willingness to submit every part of our body, every part of our lives unto the Lord. Let's talk to the Lord. Brethren, let's talk to the Lord. Many of us think we have been serving the Lord. But I want you to think back. Have you really been serving his purpose? Or you have been serving your purpose? Have you been serving the Lord as he has purposed for you to serve him? Or you have been serving him as you have purposed? Serving the Lord is what that lame man who was made to walk did when he stood beside Peter and John. He wasn't asked any question. Neither did he utter a word. He just stood there. But by standing there, he silenced the Sanhedrin. Let's pray. What is it that the Lord is asking us to do? What is the challenge that the Lord is asking of us? Let's talk to him. Say, Father, help us. Father, help me. Father, help me. Help me to serve you acceptably in holiness. Help me to serve you as a living sacrifice. Haven't given up myself to you. Haven't given up everything to you to do as you will. Help me to serve you acceptably, almighty and everlasting God. Help me, King of glory. Lord, help me to seize from wanting to know the end from the beginning. Help me to walk with you by faith. To go when you say I should go. To stand when you say I should stand. To sit when you ask me to sit. To speak what you want me to speak. And to speak it at the time. Help me to be like that faithful servant. Who gave what was supposed, what was due to the other servants. In due season at the right time. Help me, Lord. Help me, Almighty and everlasting God. Brethren, let's talk to the Lord. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us. He's willing to help us. He wants to help us. Look at the Macedonian church. With all the affliction that they went through, the Bible says they, they, they gave themselves to the Lord. They, they earnestly besought Paul and his company to take from them the little, even though it was small, and they didn't want to take them. They knew that these people were poor. They knew they were facing affliction. They said, no, take from us. We want to be part of what, the, what good thing God is doing. Let's talk to the Lord. Let's pray that God will remove that spirit of murmuring. That spirit of complaining. That spirit of procrastination. That spirit of wanting to serve ourselves. Rather than serving the Lord. Of wanting to serve men, eye service, rather than serving the Lord. We should get ourselves to the place where we can serve without supervision. Where you don't need anybody to be telling you, have you served, have you done this? Where the Spirit of God is the one directing you and leading you. Pray. Ask the Lord to help you. To vanquish from your life. Procrastination. To vanquish from your life, murmuring and complaining. 
to be open to serving the Almighty God on His terms, not on our terms. Be prepared to pay the price of death if that is what is needed. Talk to the Lord. Father, we just want to thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you, Lord, for challenging us today. Thank you, Almighty and everlasting God, for meeting us at a point of need. Thank you, Lord, for touching us where it matters the most. I pray, Lord, along with your children and for myself also, that, Father, you will help us to serve you continually, not to be tired, to serve you faithfully, to serve you productively and effectively, to serve you with humility, to serve you in holiness, to serve you without procrastination, to be fervent in our service, to be passionate in our service. We ask Almighty and everlasting God that you help us. Blessed be your name, Almighty and everlasting God. Even when temptation comes, Father, help us to overcome. Help us to bear those burdens, not to want to avoid them, but to overcome them. Help us, King of kings and Lord of lords, to be ready for persecution and to find joy even in persecution. Thank you, everlasting Father. Blessed be your name, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen.